In this video, I'm going to talk about virtual reality headsets and what we can expect from the future. I've already covered things like full body tracking and haptic gloves in another video. I'm going to be going into some detail about comfort, screen resolution, field of view and refresh rate, as well as other tech like eye tracking, foveated rendering and wireless headsets. Let's start with comfort and form factor, because there's no point in having the highest resolution headset with ultra wide field of view if you can only wear it for 30 to 40 minutes before it starts to hurt your face. Right now we have a couple of different styles with baseball cap style as seen on the Valve Index or the Oculus Quest, or the headband fitment as seen in the PSVR or the Oculus Rift S. There are most headsets obviously, but I don't want to go into too much detail. The problem is, everyone's head is different. So what's comfortable for one person isn't for the other. The ultimate would be something like the Panasonic prototype VR glasses, which are like swimming goggles that you slide onto your face more like traditional sunglasses. The issue with this is trying to keep the weight low enough while having all the other features we want. Magic Leap, who make some AR glasses, have gone for a headband type design with no top strap and have the weight distributed evenly making them comfortable. I could see us getting to this stage with VR headsets in the future. Oculus have been showing off their prototype headsets over the years, with an update in September showing how they're reducing the size of the headsets. The headset on the left is the same size as the original Rift, with the far right headset looking much smaller, more like ski goggles and obviously light enough to not need a top strap. We've already seen prototypes of contact lenses that can display video, but I personally would never use something like this. I used to wear contact lenses for years and after a while I had issues with my right eye and they would get uncomfortable after a short space of time. I wouldn't personally be prepared to put something actually onto my eyeball. I own a Valve Index and I'm personally very happy with the comfort, but obviously it could always be better. The Quest is front heavy and needs modifying to make it something you can actually use for longer play sessions. The Index is a whopping 238 grams heavier than the Quest, which shows how important weight distribution is over weight. It's going to be interesting to see how virtual reality headsets evolve over the next few years. Next, let's talk about the most requested feature for future headsets, which is wireless. We've already got some wireless options. We've got the Oculus Quest, which has built-in mobile processor unit, but it's obviously limited in the games it can run, or you can connect it to your PC wirelessly by using a program called Virtual Desktop. But you do need a good 5G router, and it's not perfect as it compresses the video down and then unpacks it again at the Quest end. This results in a downgrade in picture quality and you can also have issues when you lose signal temporarily. We've got a couple of options for the PC VR headsets with the Vive, Vive Pro and the Vive Cosmos having an official wireless adapter which features Intel's Gwigig technology. You need a free PCIe slot and the video feed is compressed and unpacked at the headset with low latency. This solution does use some CPU power so you definitely need a high-end CPU. The other option is the TP-Cast, which supports the original Oculus Rift and HTC Vive. It uses a 5G router to transmit the video feed to the headset natively without any compression, and it doesn't add any extra load onto your CPU. Unfortunately, it isn't always reliable, sometimes dropping signal, and some people have had issues where it just stops working altogether. There's no perfect solution yet, and it's obviously a difficult problem to solve, especially at a reasonable price, as we haven't seen many options despite it being a sought-after feature. It's also a trade-off in other areas. The battery and receiver add more weight to the headset, and it can limit your playtime depending on how long the battery lasts. Some people use a pulley system to suspend the wire off the floor. I've tried this myself, but I don't have a permanent VR play space, so I end up using a mic stand, which worked well for 90% of the time but the other 10% consisted of either the cable brushing against my head or it being too taut and I could feel the cable tug as I moved around. If you have a permanent play space, it could be something to look into. Moving on to screen resolution, the PlayStation VR is currently the lowest on the consumer market at 1080 by 960 pixels per eye, with the Pimax 8KX the highest at 3840 by 2160 pixels per eye. But those numbers only tell part of the story. Other factors need to be taken into consideration, like the field of view, which I'll go into more detail shortly, the screen utilization, this is how much of the screen you actually see through the lenses, and also the type of screens used. There are two main types, OLED and LCD. 
Most OLED screens use a pentile pixel arrangement, while most LCD screens use an RGB stripe arrangement. You can see here that the RGB offers a much clearer image even when using identical resolution screens. This is simply down to how the pixels are arranged on the screen, with RGB having more sub-pixels filling the gaps between each pixel better. As with everything, it does come with some trade-offs. The LCD displays have permanent backlight, which means that you never get true blacks, whereas the OLED screens have a each individual pixel is lit separately, so you can actually turn off that pixel if required to get deeper, truer blacks. In an ideal world, we'd be using OLED screens with RGB stripe pixel arrangement. But finding screens that have a low enough persistence, high resolution and refresh rate seems to be an issue. This is why most of the newer headsets are using LCD displays. Moving back to resolution, if you factor all these different things in, the actual number we need to focus on is the PPI, which stands for pixel per inch. Using the PPI, the HP Reverb is actually the highest with a massive 1057 PPI versus the Pimax 8KX which is at 534 PPI. So what about future headsets? Right now the best in terms of clarity is the Varjo VR2 which boasts human eye resolution which is as good as it gets. This is over 3000 PPI. It uses a bionic display using two screens per eye. One is the equivalent of a Vive Pro screen and then in the center, a micro OLED, which when combined with the other screen, gives you human retina level resolution. This means that the center of the screen is ultra sharp, but if you move your eyes, you'll then be looking at a normal resolution screen as found in consumer headsets. It's an interesting idea, but this is built for the commercial market and it's extremely expensive at $6,000. I think as time goes on, we're going to see more dedicated screens being made specifically for VR. Samsung unveiled a VR display back in 2018, which boasts a 1200 PPI. We haven't actually seen this used in any headset yet. If we go back to field of view, the human eye has a field of view of 220 degrees horizontally. Most VR headsets have around 100 to 110, so around half. When you have the headset on and you're immersed in the game or world, you don't really notice it that much, but the larger is always better. I upgraded from a Rift to an Index and I immediately noticed the difference. Trying to go back, it really felt like my view was restricted. The Pimax 5K Plus and 8K are currently the highest field of view headsets on the consumer market, with a horizontal field of view of 170 degrees. The highest field of view available is the Star VR headset, which is 210 degrees, so pretty much offers a full field of view. All this comes at a cost though. The Star VR is extremely expensive and not really aimed at the consumer market. The Pimax is more affordable at $700, although one issue some people report is distortion in the image when looking around the screen. Having a high field of view also causes issues with performance. Having more pixels to render puts more strain on your graphics card and can result in low frame rates. If you want to use a Pimax, you need a high-end graphics card. A GTX 1080 Ti is a minimum, which are around $700 to $800, but ideally you're going to need an RTX card, which go for over $1000. It's all high-end stuff for the enthusiast with deep pockets. If you do have an RTX card, you can actually use foveated rendering to help with performance. This is where the center of the screen where you mainly focus on is high resolution, but the edges of the screen are rendered at lower resolution, helping reduce the load on the graphics card and improving frame rate. This is something that we'll be seeing utilising more in the future with the help of eye tracking. We've already seen eye tracking in some of the Enterprise headsets, but the Vive Pro Eye has Tobii eye tracking built in. As the name suggests, with some hardware and software, the headsets can tell exactly where your eye is focused on. The main benefit of this will be using foveated rendering dynamically. So rather than being fixed to the edges of the screen, as you move your eyes, it will keep the image sharp and clear where you're looking. But the rest of the image will bleed out to a much lower resolution, which will dramatically improve frame rates with no compromise to the image quality you actually see. Unfortunately, this is very early days and support for eye tracking is severely limited. 
Another thing that will really help with performance in the future will be deep learning supersampling, or DLSS. We're already seeing this with Nvidia's RTX cards and non-VR games. It uses artificial intelligence to upsample the resolution and with the latest update to 2.0, the results are impressive. You can run games at 1080p and upscale them to 4K with virtually no difference in image quality but massive improvements to the frame rate. If we can use this in VR dynamically with eye tracking and foveated rendering, we could render at extremely high resolutions with excellent performance. Other things people want is high refresh rates. The higher the refresh rate, the better. We've got headsets with anything from 72Hz, like the Oculus Quest, all the way to the Valve Index, which goes up to 144Hz. The problem is running games at such a high frame rate to make use of these panels. Sony, Oculus and Valve all have different software methods to upscale the refresh rate. The leaders right now are Oculus, who use Asynchronous Space Warp 2.0, which uses data from within the game engine to predict what you're going to do and where you're going to move to double the frame rate with minimal artifacts. This is something that's still in development, and it's another method of improving performance with the hardware we already have. The last thing to consider is cost. We see many people complain that virtual reality is too expensive. And for many people, it is. And this leads to my conclusion. People want it all. They want a lightweight, comfortable headset that's wireless with high resolution screens and high field of view. And it all needs to be at an affordable price. I'm sure we're gonna get there eventually, but right now it's all a compromise. You have to pick and choose the features you want and ultimately what you can afford. The new headsets we have, like the Oculus Rift S and the Valve Index, all have their place for each market, and I'm personally happy with what we've got. Would I like all this stuff mentioned? Of course. But it will all come, and in the meantime, I'm going to enjoy your VR gaming, as what it already offers is pretty amazing. I think the main thing that I want from VR is more games. We've already got a lot of smaller indie titles, which are great, but it's the bigger AAA titles like Half-Life Alex, which really get people interested in virtual reality gaming. And that's it. Hopefully some people found this useful or interesting, and if you didn't, I'm sure you're gonna let me know. I also have another video going into the future tech of VR, like treadmills and haptic gloves. I've got another one which is about virtual reality and why it's so immersive. And if you do like my videos, you might wanna consider subscribing.